Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, the topic of this lecture is recursion. Uh, probably this is the first time you are encountering recursion. I'm sure you didn't do it in programming one or programming two. Now recursion is not a data structure as such, but as we shall see, uh, it's going to be very useful when we consider the next data structure uh, which is trees. Most of the methods of trees are going to be implemented using recursion. So it's very important to pay attention and understand uh, recursion, particularly how to write recursive methods. This is the outline. Uh, we start by looking at what are called recursive definitions. What is a recursive definition? Okay. Then from there we move on to implementing recursive methods. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time here uh, trying to get you to understand how to write recursive methods. So we're going to take several examples. Uh, on writing recursive methods. And then we will look at how recursive methods actually work because in each, initially it may look strange or mysterious how recursive methods produce their answer. Uh, it doesn't look obvious. So we shall examine how recursive method works. Hopefully that will help us understand uh, the working of recursive methods. Uh, and the final topic will be a comparison between iterative and recursive methods. Uh, most of the methods we have written so far, they are iterative. So how do they compare with uh, recursive methods? All right, these are the objectives of today's lecture. Let us get started recursive definitions. When defining infinite sets, giving a complete list of elements is obviously impossible because the set is infinite, so you cannot list all the elements. Even for large finite sets, even though you can list the elements in this case because the set is finite, it will be inefficient to do so. Okay, uh, let's see an example of what I mean. Suppose you take the set of natural numbers. We all know the set of natural numbers. These are the whole numbers, the positive whole numbers, that is. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, if you are to list the elements of this set, the best you can do is something like this. You list some of them and then stop at some point and put dot 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 and you say until infinity because you cannot list all of them they are infinite now unfortunately this is not a very good uh, definition because you see here although you list some of the elements so it may show the pattern it seems the pattern is to increase by one each time but there is no guarantee that the pattern will not change after some time. So this is not a very precise definition. Uh, so the question is, is there a way to define this set more precisely without using the dot dot dot? And the answer is yes. You can do it if you use what is called a recursive definition. So what is recursive definition? Recursive definition is one in which a concept is defined in terms of itself. Okay, and we define a term in terms of itself. This is where the word recursive comes. So the definition recurs. Okay, let's see an example. With the same set of uh, natural numbers, you can define it recursively as follows. So you can say, for example, uh, 1, 0 belong to the set. Okay, 0 belongs to the set of natural numbers. And 2, 
if a number n belong to the set, then n plus 1 belong to the set. And that is it. This uh, last part actually will help us to generate all the other elements. Okay, so this is what is called a recursive definition. You see here we are defining belonging to in terms of belonging to. We say n plus, if n belongs, then n plus 1 also belongs. So we are defining n plus 1 belongs in terms of n belongs. Okay, the belong appears on both sides. And therefore it is called recursive. Okay, so this is what is meant by recursive definition. Uh, let's examine it in a little more detail in the next slide. Um, a recursive definition consists of two parts. Uh, one, the first part is called base case. Sometimes it is also called the anchor case or the ground case. The most common term is actually base case, and this is the one we shall be using. Okay. Now, in this case, the basic elements that are the building blocks of the other elements in the set are listed. Okay, so just like we listed uh, for the set of natural numbers and we say zero belong to the set. Okay, so that is the base case. The second part is called the recursive case. So in this part, rules are given that will allow the construction of new objects out of the basic elements. Okay, I, that is the basic element listed in part A. Or objects that have already been constructed using the rule. Okay, so for example, uh, we can say one belongs to the set because what? Is if you add zero to one, <coughs> You get, you're going to get one. And the rule says, if n belongs to the set, so is n plus one. Okay? So that is the idea. Uh, yeah, so basically in terms of our natural number set, uh, this is the complete uh, definition, the recursive definition. So zero belong to n is the best case. And this second part, is called the recursive case. It says if n belongs to the set, then so is n plus one. So this rule will allow us to construct new elements. Because knowing that zero belongs to the set, so zero assuming is zero is our n, it means zero plus one, which is one, belong to the set. Similarly, since one belongs to the set, one plus one, which is two, will also belong to the set, and so on and so forth. So this recursive case allows us to construct new elements out of the, or uh, either the basic ones already listed here, or some of those that are earlier generated using the same rule. Okay. Um, now the recursive part actually has two purposes. The first one we have already seen, that is generating new elements out of the, the basic ones or out of those that are already generated but it can also be used to test whether or not an element belongs to the set for example if i ask is five is in in the set of natural numbers the rule will, will allow us to check for that because it will say okay well five will belong to the set if four belong to the set, okay? Four will belong to the set if three belong to the set. Three belong to the set if two belong to the set. Two belong to the set if one belong to the set. And one will belong to the set if zero belong to the set. But zero belong to the set as stated in the base case, okay? And therefore this proves that five belong to the set. So this is the idea. We can actually use the rule to test whether a, a given element belongs to the set. Okay. 
so that, those are the two purposes of the recursive case. Now that is about sets, but recursive definitions are also frequently used to define functions or methods as they are called in Java, as well as sequences of numbers. And this is why we want to learn about it. We want to learn how to uh, use recursive definitions to come up with recursive methods. Okay. This is an example. We are all familiar with the factorial function. So we can define factorial function recursively as this. Factorial of n is 1 if n is 0. And it is n times factorial of n minus 1 if n is greater than 0. Okay? See, this is a recursive definition. We are defining factorial in terms of factorial. Factorial of n is factorial of n minus 1 times n. Okay, this is a recursive case. The base case is by definition factorial of 0 is 1. We all know that. So if n is 0, this is the answer. Factorial of 0 is 1. Okay, so this is a uh, recursive definition of factorial. Another example is the Fibonacci function, which some of you may be familiar with. Fibonacci of a number is the same number n if n is 0 or 1. So basically saying Fibonacci of 0 is 0, Fibonacci of 1 is 1. This is the best case. Okay, but if n is greater than 1, then Fibonacci of n is Fibonacci of the previous two numbers. So meaning that of n minus 1 plus that of n minus 2. Okay, so again you can see we are defining Fibonacci in terms of Fibonacci. F appears on both sides, therefore this is a recursive definition. I mean both sides of this are equal to. So this is a recursive definition. Okay, just like factorial is appearing on the left and also on the right. So we are defining factorial in terms of factorial. We are defining Fibonacci in terms of Fibonacci. And these are therefore recursive definitions. Okay, in, in all cases there will be a base case and a recursive case. Now, uh, just to expand on these definitions to see how they actually work, the factorial function, you can expand it as follows. Uh, of course, by definition, factorial of 0 is 1. So f of 0 is 1. Okay, what about f of 1? Obviously, 1 is greater than 0. So it's going to be 1 minus 1, which is 0. So basically, you are saying 1 times factorial of 0. Okay, so factorial of 1 is 1 times factorial of 0. But factorial of 0 is 1 from above here. So you have 1 times 1, which is 1. What about factorial of 2? By definition, it is 2 times factorial of 1. Okay? And we have just computed factorial of 1 above as 1. So you're going to have 2 times 1, which is 2. Factorial of 3 is 3 times factorial of 2, which is 3 times 2, which is 6. Okay, and finally, factorial of 4 is 4 times factorial of 3, which is 6. So 4 times 6 will give you 24. You can expand the Fibonacci sequence in the same way. Notice factorial of 4 is 24. I will come back to this uh, later when we test the program. For the Fibonacci, Fibonacci of 0 is 0 and Fibonacci of 1 is 1. This is based on the base case here. Fibonacci of n is n if n is 0 or 1. Okay. So, okay. What about if n is 2? So 2 definitely is greater than 1. So the answer is going to be 
Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci of 0. And there are 1 and 0 as you can see here. So 1 plus 0 will give you 1. Fibonacci of 3 will be that of 2 plus that of 1, which is 1 plus 1. So you're going to get 2. Fibonacci of 4 is that of 3 plus that of 2. And Fibonacci of 5 and 6, you get them in a similar manner. So Fibonacci of 6 is that of 5 plus that of 4, which will give you 8. So again, take note, Fibonacci of 6 is 8. We will try to see whether this is correct. All right. So this is uh, basically about recursive definition. They allow you to define sets and functions and sequences in terms of themselves. Okay. Now, what is the implication for us in terms of programming? Implementation of recursive methods. In computer science, one area where recursive definitions are used is in programming. And there is a very good news here. The good news is that virtually no effort is needed to make the transition from a recursive definition to implementation in Java. Once you are able to define uh, a function recursively, it's almost direct to convert it to Java, almost direct translation. Uh, yes, so it says here, if you can define it recursively, then you can as well implement it as a Java code. Let's see examples. Uh, the factorial function, we just define it uh, recursively like this. So factorial of n is 1 if n is 0. And it is that of n minus 1 factorial times n if n is greater than 0. How can we convert this to a Java code? Very easy. Uh, the first thing, of course, you have to come up with a um, signature for the method. So in the signature, we have to uh, come up with a name for the function. Suppose we call it factorial. OK. The function is receiving a number as input. So we will have int n as parameter. And it's going to give you a value as the result, an integer value. So the return type is also int. So this you should be able to come up with. Uh, from your experience in Java programming. If you are defining a function, definitely it will have a name. You will decide uh, what parameters, if any, you need to have and whether the function is void or not. Now, once you are able to do this, the rest come directly from the recursive definition. All you have to do is think of this as if statement. You see, if n is equal to 0, the answer is 1. Otherwise, meaning if it is greater than 0, the answer is this. So just convert this into an if statement. You see here it's saying if n is 0, return 1. Else, return n times... So, of course, in uh, Java, times is denoted using star. Times factorial of n minus 1. Now, if this is factorial of n, to get factorial of n minus 1, you just have to call the same function or the same method, but give it n minus 1 as your input. This will give you the factorial of n minus 1. So, you can see this is almost direct translation. Just convert this into an if statement and you will have a function. Okay. Now, normally I will delay running these uh, examples uh, until the lab session. Uh, but because this function looks so mysterious to you, since this is your first time of encountering recursion, Maybe it is a good idea at this point to try to run this factorial function to see whether it will work. 
okay so i have here in netbeans the factorial function exactly as we saw it there okay uh, just i added public static because it's not going to be called for an object so we have to make it static okay so factorial of int n say if n is 0 return 1 else return n times factorial of n minus 1 let us try to test this function from the main so in the main we create a scanner object and then we ask the user to give us a number i'm going to test it with four as we saw in the example there factorial of four we all remember is 24 so let us see whether this program will give us the correct result so we're going to read an integer from the user and then we call the function factorial of n to print out the result of course the factorial since it is not void we have to call it as part of print line so we say factorial of n is then you call the method let us run this and see how it will work run file okay let us uh, enter our 4 and you see it is telling you the factorial of 4 is 24 so the function is really working without doing any loop it is able to print for you the factorial of n can you guess what will be the factorial of 5 is going to be 24 times 5 you know 5 times factorial of 4 okay so let us run the program again with 5 and see uh, if you give your n as 5 you will get 120 which is actually what you would get when you multiply 24 by 5 is 120 and so on so this is the factorial function uh, let's continue uh, let's take the Fibonacci as the second example all right try to see if we can convert this definition to Java code again we need to come up with uh, a method signature so we call it fib as the name obviously the input is a number int n and the return type is a value okay so an int value so the return type is int all right the rest as i said is just from the recursive definition here so here it says if n is zero or n is one just return the n so in java just you need to change this equal to equal equal because the equal in math in in it has to be converted to equal equal in java so if n equal equal zero or n equal equal one return n else return calling the same method that you are defining which is fib okay call the function fib with n minus 1 plus call it again with n minus 2 this is if n is greater than 1 so this is the else part okay so this again is how you will implement this method it will look mysterious uh, but it will give you the correct result later on we will examine actually how does it really work okay so again uh, let us temporarily leave the slide and test this example. All the examples uh, will be given to you in the lab document. If you download the zip file, you will see them. But just to show you that they actually work, we can run the Fibonacci function. It is here. Fib of n is n if n is 0 or 1. Otherwise, it is Fibonacci of the last two n's. Okay, so add that of n minus 1 plus that of n minus 2. Okay, so in the main, I ask the user to enter a number n. Okay, but this time, actually, instead of just calling the method once with the n, I'm going to call it in a loop from 0 until n. Okay, uh, let's change it to less than or equal. So it will give us the Fibonacci of all the numbers 
from 0 until n. Say so for i from 0, as long as i is less than or equal to n, uh, print Fibonacci of i. Okay, so we're going to call it, let's say, with 8, and we'll see whether it will give us the correct Fibonacci. Okay. Uh, with six actually in the example we saw there we stop at six, but actually you can call it with any number uh, Since it's going to show all of them anyway Okay, so if you run this uh, example Okay, so enter an integer n To print the first n terms of the Fibonacci sequence. Let us put 10 actually Okay, so these are the Fibonacci sequence uh, or this is the Fibonacci sequence So we have 0 Then 1 These are the basic ones The next one will just be the addition of this So it's going to be 1 The next one will be the addition of the last 2 So you're going to get 2 Okay, next one again will be 1 plus 2 Which is 3 Next one will be 2 plus 3 Which is 5 Next one will be 3 plus 5 Which is 8 I think this is where we stop in the example But the sequence continues Okay, next one will be 5 plus 8, which is 13. Next one is 8 plus 13, which is 21, and so on and so forth. So the Fibonacci function that you saw there is actually working. Okay, uh, let's continue. Now, in the last two examples, the recursive definition was given to us. We were lucky, we were given the recursive definition. And therefore, we only have to convert to Java, which we saw is a straightforward thing. However, for many problems, the recursive definition is not usually provided. You will just be given the problem, and you have to come up first with the recursive definition. So it says here, in such cases, the first step is to formulate a recursive definition for the problem. Now I'll try to guide you how to do this. It involves basically about four steps. Step number one, try to reduce the problem size. Okay, so you are giving a problem of size n. Try to see if you can reduce the problem size, usually by one. So if you reduce it by one, it will be of size n minus one. Okay, so the, for, the, for example, for the factorial problem, uh, instead of looking at factorial of n, we will look at factorial of n minus 1. So n minus 1 factorial. This is step number 1. Try to reduce the problem size, usually by 1. Step number 2, define the original problem of size n in terms of the reduced problem, that is the one of size n minus 1. So in other words, can we relate the problem with size n with the problem of size n minus 1? Can we find an equation for those? Okay. Uh, for example, for the factorial problem, if we are given factorial of n minus 1 definitely to get the factorial of n we only need to multiply this by n so this is the relationship if you can find it then you have already found the recursive case for your recursive definition remember recursive definition involves two cases base case and the recursive case okay so step one ask yourself what is the reduced version of the problem if you reduce the size by one what will be the problem okay so instead of finding n factorial you will say okay i will try to find n minus one factorial okay then you will say okay now suppose i know this suppose i know n minus one factorial how can i find n factorial well n factorial is simply going to be n times n minus 1 factorial and if, for example if you are looking for 5 factorial and someone told you this is 4 factorial then you know that you only need to multiply that 4 factorial by 5 to get 5 factorial 
so this is the idea if you can do this then you have already come up with the recursive case step number three try to identify the base case and you do this usually by asking yourself if you keep reducing the size of the problem by one by one by one what will be the smallest possible size that you're gonna have and what is the answer in that case okay so this is what we said here usually this will be obtained when the problem size reduces to zero or one so for the factorial problem this will mean zero factorial because if you keep reducing n by one eventually it will reach zero we know of course uh, factorial is not defined for negative numbers so the smallest possible value you can have is zero and by the definition of factorial we know that factorial of zero is one okay so this will give us therefore the, the base case for our factorial so the last step is to now combine these two cases the recursive case and the base case to form a general recursive definition so you will say n factorial will be one if n is zero this is the base case or it will be this if n is greater than zero so that will give you the recursive definition and as we saw once you have the recursive definition you will be able to come up with the uh, java code for the uh, problem you are solving now we're going to take a few examples to demonstrate this idea first example it says write a recursive method print to n that takes an integer n as an input and print all the integers from 0 until n okay so if I give you 5 here as the input I want you to print 0 1 2 3 4 5 if I give you 10 I want you to print 0 1 2 3 and so on until 10 so this is what this method is supposed to do print to n meaning print from 0 to n good so this is the problem but we are not given the recursive definition for this we have to come up with this ourselves okay uh, it may help by first thinking of this in terms of loop okay iteratively using loop this actually is very easy you just need a simple loop that will go from 0 until n and keep keep printing your i so for i from 0 to n uh, just print i and then increment i by 1 until i reaches n so you're going to print 0 1 2 3 4 and so on n minus 2 n minus 1 until n good but now we need to we don't want the iterative definition we want a recursive definition this is iterative definition anytime you see dot 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 until you are actually thinking of it in terms of loop let us see how we can convert this to recursive definition so for this we simply follow the four steps that i introduced you in the last slide and the first step says reduce the problem size which is now n by one so that it will be n minus uh, of size n minus one in other words instead of saying print to n we will say print to n minus one okay good second step you will ask yourself what is the relationship between this print to n minus one and print to n in other words if someone has already printed for you from zero until n minus one what else do you have to do to complete the original task which is to print until n okay you can clearly see this from this iterative definition because print to n minus one 
will actually print 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on until n minus 1. So all of this has already been done for you for free. Assuming it has been done for you, what do you have to do to print the whole sequence? What else is left? Clearly, all that is left is printing the n. All of this have been printed. Okay? So this is what uh, is the second step. Say so define the original problem. The original problem is to print from 0 to n. So define that in terms of the reduced problem. Okay? So the reduced problem is print to n minus 1. And you can see, therefore, print to n is print to n minus 1, and then print the n. Because print to n will print from 0 until n minus 1. So all that is left is printing the n itself, printing n alone. Okay? So this is your recursive definition, or recursive case. This is a recursive case. So print to n means print to n minus 1. After that, print the n itself. All right? Good. So we have a recursive case already. The next step is try to identify the base case. So the base case is, as we said, try to imagine if you keep subtracting by 1, by 1, by 1, what is the smallest possible value you're going to have? Well, the problem says print from 0 to n. So the smallest possible case is if n is 0. Okay? If n is 0. So if n is 0, to print from 0 to n actually simply means print the 0. All right? So that's what we are saying here. Identify the base case. This is step number 3. And this is usually when the problem size reduces to 0 or 1. In this case, when it reduces to 0. Okay? So what do you think will mean if we, we mean if we say print to 0? Okay, print 0 actually simply means print 0. Because it means 0 to 0. 0 to 0 is only one number, which is 0 itself. So print 0 itself. Okay? So, these are the two cases, the recursive case and the base case. Now, can you combine them to form a general recursive definition? Obviously, yes. So, print to n means print the n if n is 0. Okay? Print the n itself if n is 0. But if n is greater than 0, it means print the n minus 1, after that, print the n alone. Okay, so this is your recursive definition. And now with this, it should be easy to convert this to Java. Okay, so having obtained a recursive definition for the problem, it is now straightforward to implement it as a Java code. Okay, so let us see. Uh, First point to note is this print to is just doing a printing. So it's definitely not returning a value. And therefore, it's going to be a void method. Okay? So we need a name. The name given is good enough. Keep it, print to. And it's going to receive n as input. So we're going to have int n as parameter. So this is the signature of our method. The rest is simply convert this into an if statement. So it says, if n is 0, print the n. How do we print n in Java? By saying system.out.println. It's as simple as that. So if n is 0, system.out.println. Else, meaning n is greater than 0. So we have two things to do. First, we have to print to n minus 1. Now, to print to n minus 1, all we have to do is call the method again, but don't give it n. Give it n minus 1 as your argument. 
okay so print n minus 1 after that print the n itself how do we print n in java by saying system dot out dot print line n okay so this is the method which will print for us for any number we give it will print all the numbers 0 1 2 3 and so on until that n okay now another uh, point to note uh, is that if you are to reverse these two lines so you print the n before you do print to n minus 1 you will be surprised at the output it is actually going to print the numbers in reverse so for example if you give it 10 it will print 10 then 9 then 8 and so on until 0 let me show you the uh, the reverse version said so to print the numbers in reverse all we need to do is to swap the two statements in the else part so if you swap these two lines we will have the numbers printed but instead of having them from 0 until n we will have them from n down until 0 okay so there is nothing to do in the no change in the base case is simply uh, print the n if n is 0 but for the recursive case just swap these two lines and you will see that they are printed in reverse so we print the n before we print we reverse print to n minus one of course uh, remember to change the name of the method also here when you are calling okay uh, now i'm going to show you these two methods uh, in real life so that you can see that they are actually working so let's go to netbeans this is the uh, print to method first of all the non-reverse one as we discuss print to n if n is zero just print it otherwise call the method with n minus one then print the n itself okay so this is the one that will print them from zero until n and we said if you reverse the two statements so you do the printing of the n first before you make a recursive call with n minus one okay let us test and see whether this will work uh, so in the main you're gonna read a number from the user n and we call print2 notice print2 is void method actually both methods are void so you don't need a print line just call the method alone okay then it says the numbers in reverse are you call the other method reverse print2 okay so let's run this program uh, with n equal to 10 for example and see how it works so suppose you say 10 and this is the output interestingly so the first one is given as 0 until 10 and the reverse one is given as 10 until 0 okay isn't this interesting without a loop we have the numbers from 0 to 10 printed just by repeated recursive calls okay we shall later explain actually how these recursive methods how they really work okay the next example is similar it says write a recursive method print odds n meaning print all the odd numbers from 0 until n so it takes an integer number n and print all the odd integers from 0 until n okay uh, so it's you can see it's similar to the other problem it's just that instead of printing all of the numbers we are only interested in printing the odd ones among them so again we have to formulate the solution as a recursive definition so to do that you follow our four steps uh, you will ask yourself what will be the reduced version of the problem uh, basically it will be by reducing n by one so it will be print odds n minus one 
next step is to say okay assume someone has done this for me assume somebody has printed printed all the odd numbers from 0 until n minus 1 what else do I have to do what else is left for me to do in other words what is the relationship between the original problem of size n and this reduced version okay obviously if someone has printed all the odd numbers from 0 1 2 and so on until n minus 1 for you you are left with just n to consider and that n you have to check if it is odd or not if it is odd you will print it otherwise you don't therefore we can say the original problem print odds from 0 until n is the same as print odds until n minus 1 and then print n if n is odd okay this is basically the recursive version of the problem the second step is to identify the base case usually by reducing the problem to its smallest size usually 0 or 1 now in this case we know for example 0 is even so there is no need to keep reducing until 0 okay if you keep subtracting 1 from your n it will reach 1 and we definitely know that 1 is an odd number therefore your base case should be from 0 until 1 and we know that there is only one odd number between 0 and 1 which is the 1 itself and therefore well, there is no need to do any recursive call just print the 1 directly okay uh, as I said no need to reach 0 because 0 is considered to be even so this is the base case for our problem combining these two we're gonna have print odds until n means print the n itself if n is 1 if n is 1 just print it because 1 is odd but if n is greater than 1 then print odds until n minus 1 after that check if n itself is odd then print it okay so this is the recursive definition for this problem and now it is easy to convert it to java as we did with the other one you need uh, method heading or method signature obviously the method is only printing so it's going to be void there is nothing to return keep the name as is print odds the input is int n and now according to this recursive definition it says if n is 1 just print it how do we print n in java system.out.println n else we do these two statements so the first one is just a recursive call print odds n minus 1 this will print for you all the odds from 0 until n minus 1 therefore after that you only have to consider the n itself is it odd if it is odd printed now how do we know if a number n is odd just take the remainder by dividing by 2 if the remainder is 1 definitely n is odd okay so print the n so if n remainder 2 is 1 print the n what if it is not don't do anything there is no need to print it because it will be even then okay so that is it this is your method again like we saw with the other one you can actually reverse uh, print this odds by simply swapping these two statements and we're going to see that in the java code so this is the java code for this example print odds as you can see print odds will print the n if n is 1 this is the best case otherwise it will make a recursive call with n minus 1 after that it will check if n is odd print it okay the reverse version just involve 
doing this after the if statement so uh, you can see we are doing the print uh, reverse print odds after the if statement okay now let's uh, see how we test it we need to read the input from the user uh, n and then we just call the two methods so print odds n reverse print odds n let's run it quickly if you run file okay let's say again our input is 10 and you can see the odd numbers are 1 3 5 7 and 9 in reverse they are 9 7 5 3 1 all right so that is the print odd example and again it shows you interestingly how we can print all the odds without ever needing a loop no for loop no while loop no loop at all just by making a recursive call okay let's take the next example next example says write a recursive method power x n that takes two numbers a double x and an integer n and then it will return x to power n and you have to do this recursively okay write a recursive method it says it may help to see what this means in terms of iteration what does x to power n means okay this is actually what it means it means multiply x by itself x times x times x times x n times okay for example 2 to power 3 means 2 times 2 times 2 so keep multiplying the x n times this is the idea all right now let's let us try and come up with the recursive definition for this as usual the first step see if you can reduce the size of the problem in this case the problem size is denoted by the n here not the x okay it is the n we are multiplying the x n times so it will be if n reduces to n minus 1 so the uh, the reduced version of the problem is power x n minus 1 it is our multiply the x by itself n minus 1 times this is what the reduced version of the problem is now assuming somebody has done this for us what else is left for us to do to compute x to power n clearly we only need to multiply the result of this by x this multiplication until n minus one time has been done for us so to get the overall result just you have to multiply one more time the result of this by x therefore in terms of defining the original problem relative to the reduced size this is the answer power x n is the same as power x n minus 1 times x this is a recursive case okay you should always be able to do this so the reduced size is this and the original relative to the reduced size will be this what will be the base case so again the base case you will be asking yourself if i keep subtracting one in this our size n what is the smallest possible value we're going to have obviously it will be zero and we know that anything to power zero is is one anything to power zero is one this is by definition so therefore uh, we can say that the base case will be when n reduces to zero in that case power x zero we know the answer is one x to power zero is one so combine these two to come up with your recursive definition and it says power x n is one if n is zero and it is x times power n x n minus one if n is greater than zero and with this we can easily now come with the uh, java code okay obviously the result is going to be type double this time because we are multiplying a double value x times something 
we're gonna get a double result okay keep the name as power and the two input x is double and n is int okay so convert this into an if statement if n is zero so if n equal equal zero return one else return x times power x n minus one as simple as this x times power x you're going to assume the recursion will take care of finding this for you so assuming you have this what do you have to do to get the answer just multiply by x quickly let us see it in real life this is the power function exactly as we saw there and we're going to ask the user to enter two values the x and the n and then we call the method power xn to see the result uh, if you run it so let us say we want to find a 2 to power 10 which is 1 kilo okay 1024 this is the answer okay so it's saying 2 to power 10 is 1024 okay so it means the power function is actually working correctly uh, the last example i will show you is the a method to add an array let us look at it example number six write a recursive method add a until last that takes an array of integers a so this a is an array and index of the last element so last here is the index of the last element in the array and return the sum of the elements in the array so we want to add all the elements in the array uh, basically iteratively you can think of it like this we have an array from zero until last so we want to add the elements so of course it's going to be the element at zero plus the element at one plus the element at two plus the element until at last minus one plus the element at last this is the last index so this is how to think of it iteratively it's good to do this because it will help you to come up with the recursive definition okay good so with this can we convert this to a recursive definition uh, just follow your steps okay you will ask yourself what is the reduced size of this problem how can you reduce it by at least one reduce the size of the problem by one well the original question says add the element in the array from zero until the last cell so to reduce it therefore you will say what what if i just reduce this last index by one okay so you say add a until last minus one essentially that will give you the addition of all the elements except the last one okay so this is the reduced version of the problem add a until last minus one okay good so assuming somebody has done this for you somebody has added all these elements for you until the index last minus one what else do you have to do to add all the elements clearly you only have to add this last element a at last therefore the relationship between the original problem a until last and this reduced version is simply the reduced version plus a at last okay so this is your recursive case a until last or add elements in a until last is the same as add elements in a until last minus one after that add a at last which is just one element to the result okay good what is the base case 
the base case, if you keep reducing this last index, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, definitely it will reach 0. So, if you say add elements in the array A until 0, what are you really saying? You are only interested in the first element, the one at 0. Therefore, the base case is add the elements in A until 0 is simply the element at 0. There is no recursion needed in this case. We know the element is the first element, which is at 0. So combining these two, this is your recursive definition. Add A until last is the element at uh, last if last is 0. Otherwise, it is add elements until last minus 1 plus the last element itself. This is the recursive definition. Just combining these two will give you the recursive definition. And once you have this, again, the answer is straightforward. You just change the, the recursive definition to an if statement. So obviously the method is returning the result of the addition, so it's going to return an int, since we, what we have is an array of integer. Okay, the input is an array of integer and the last index. Okay, so as the definition here says, if last is 0, return a at 0 or a at last. Doesn't matter because last and 0 are the same. So you can put last here if you like. Okay, else return the result of this recursive call, add a last minus 1 plus a at last okay so this is the method so there's a small issue with the recursive add array method to call it the user must provide not only an array but also the initial value of last uh, for example if you have an array a containing the numbers from uh, 1 to 10 then to call that method you have to give your array a but you also have to give a value for the last index well this is last index will be 9 because this is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so the last index is 9 this is how you must call the method because the method is expecting you to provide last but the value of initial last can be computed by the computer. So why do we have to compute it? We know that this is simply a at length minus 1. a at length, the total number of elements. So if you subtract 1, you will get this 9. Okay. So since it can be computed by the program, it does not make sense to expect the user to provide it. Okay, so how can we avoid this? So to solve this problem, what is normally done is we overload the method. Okay, we're going to have another one that takes only the array A. And then it will call the other one, giving it the value of last. Uh, see what I mean here? So we will have this method as before. But we will also have another add method. Overload means they will have the same name. Okay. But this one will expect only the array. So the user only need to give his array. Okay. But we know that this method need the last. So we call it return add the same array a. But we will say a dot length minus one. Okay, so we have two methods now, this and this. All right, this overloaded version is normally called auxiliary method or helper method. The idea is to help the user when he is calling this method, he doesn't need to provide this, the, this argument because the program can compute it by itself. So, uh, 
we compute that value by saying a dot length minus one and call this method okay so this is the one the user will call but to get the result this method will call the other one all it is doing is it is uh, computing the value of last which is basically just a dot length minus one okay uh, so with this the user only need to say int sum add a so he has an array like this to call to find the sum of the elements of this array he will only need to say add a which is more natural than saying add a nine okay this is the idea now it is very common for recursive method to be implemented as a pair like this the real recursive method and an auxiliary method okay and we shall see many cases like this when we look at trees most of the methods they come in pair one that expect an initial var value for a variable and one that will actually provide the value for that variable so this is the one the user is expected to call now let us run this example and see if it works uh, in netbeans we have test add array so here are the two methods as i described okay nothing new uh, and to test it i have defined an array here and initialize it with the values so to find the sum you just need to call this time no input is needed from the user because the array has already been defined and the auxiliary method only need the array so you could just say the sum of the elements in the array is add array okay so let's run this program and it is telling you the sum of the elements is 55 okay so this is the idea and uh, this is the last example uh, I have in this uh, lecture. In the next remaining part, we're going to look at actually how does recursive method work.